I arrived in Vancouver four years ago from Lebanon with like just $300 in my pocket. And I was, of course, I was welcomed into my sister's house. I stayed with them for like a few months uh, to a year. And uh, very soon after coming, um, just a guy from Lebanon, I realized there's such a huge perception among the youth in Vancouver that buying a house is just like a pipe dream. Absolutely impossible. Like there was just this. And and I've talked to so many elderly people in my in my jobs here that uh, I've I've had the pleasure of meeting so many people who own houses and property in Richmond, North Vancouver, all, all those places, and they they often told me like uh, your generation is screwed, you know, you you guys are screwed. There's no way you're buying property. What uh, he, like I met this guy, Mr. Jefferson. He bought his house in uh, North Vancouver uh, for like forty thousand dollars, like fifty years ago. That's amazing. That's what I make in a year. 40,000, like, dude? 40,000. Wow. He has a huge house. I was like, there's I'd no way. I'd buy it right now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah, of course. His children are living with him, and his children are in their 30s, you know? No, uh, no, I'm only 26. You have to look but, at the 40,000 itself. The 40,000, due to inflation, and it has increased in value. Like that property did not really increase in value. That, that, is, that, that is true, but the, the housing market itself has, has just exponentially gone up way more than, than the prices of inflation and because wages. It was and... easy to get money. Before, it was really, really cheap to get money. Yeah, I mean, yeah. no, the, the housing market in Vancouver is really bad, though. Like, it's just really bad. Like, it's... It's, um, it's bad. I mean, like, so here's here's where that optimism comes out, right? Because I hear this a lot, too, and this is, like, I get so much heat on TikTok for talking about this. Like, TikTok's, like, my main platform. I actually talk about this a lot, right? This whole mindset that it's impossible to buy real estate in Vancouver, right? If you think it's impossible, it's obviously going to be impossible. Like, you're shelving mm-hmm. yourself out of the market right there with that mm-hmm. mindset. It's mm-hmm. not impossible. It's just from what I've seen – a lot of people aren't willing to do what's necessary to actually get into the market. I know it's hard. Like I moved 35 minutes further away from where I grew up just to get into the market. But a lot of people that I talk to aren't willing to do that. They don't want to move from like Yale town to new West and sacrifice for five to six years and work, you know, uh, all the overtime hours that are necessary. Or <laughs> I live whatever. in the West, by the way. There you go. Exactly. Right. <laughs> so a lot of people aren't willing to do that and then do the commute. And I would also say that like, the way the economy has changed, like, yes, all of these older jobs like mechanic and teacher and nurse and all these things haven't kept pace with, uh, you know, the price of homes, like wages haven't right. kept up with the price of homes. But the way the economy's changed now, there's this whole new economy, exactly what you guys are doing, the, the creator economy and the digital economy. Woo. And you can get into that. Oh, stuff. yeah. And make money there. You know what I mean? Like supplement your income with whatever job you're doing now and get into the creator economy. It is definitely easier to make money today than it was 10, 15 years ago. But you just have to get out there. You have to put your face out there and do all that stuff, right? So although all the opportunity in the old economy has been diminished and it's way harder to succeed over there, there's all this new opportunity that has been sprung in the the, uh, creator economy and online, right? So... I mean, there's just so many ways that you can get into the market. I hate this idea that, oh, it's just impossible. So I'm just going to complain about it every day and hate landlords. Like, I, I don't know. You know, things I want to do, I want to comment on that. Like uh, the creator, the, the thing about the creator economy is that it's like, I, I feel like only the top 5% of creators that get into this industry are able to make the sort of income that would allow you to buy property in somewhere like Vancouver. I, I feel like, I mean... Most people are not going to make enough money doing this, creating, you know, uh, Shopify, you know, online platform, whatever uh, type thing that would allow them to get that sort of money. You know, um, I mean, of course, you're the you're an exception for sure. Connor Kelly, uh, I've heard of you from some people here. But uh, I mean, it's I feel like generally I actually resigned myself recently because uh, I talked to a real estate agent and he told me like, um, with your level of income, because I make almost fifty thousand, I'm, I'm grateful uh, a year um, at a, a really high-paying restaurant job. But my girlfriend as well, she's hoping to get into her career field that makes that much money. But uh, it's it's just it's very yes, we'd have to start in a condo and it would take us years to move up from property to property to be able to afford a house. When we actually looked at options, my girlfriend from Mexico, we actually are able to. 
within like a quarter of the time span buy two or three properties in mexico for example or you know like a you know mm. a hacienda in mexico or like property in lebanon or for example in in in, in italy it's so much cheaper I, i'd rather own 10 houses in italy than buy one house in vancouver because that's the price difference yeah no that's a great point man and, and i would say the same thing like if you were to rent right now in vancouver it's way cheaper than owning right so you could rent in vancouver and then buy something somewhere else. Just like you were saying, you could buy in Mexico or Italy wow. or you could buy in Calgary or just build equity somewhere else. But I would never recommend being completely out of real estate. Like you should have a stake somewhere, right? And then eventually take the equity that you've built somewhere else and then you could transfer that into the Vancouver market later on if you wanted to, right? So that's a great point. You could totally do that, right? Yeah, you don't have to have full ownership. You can also take partial parts. You don't have to be like complete owner in one in the first asset that you want to buy exactly you can just start off small yeah or and connor i wanted to go back to the point about the content creation if you don't mind sure. because you're right people do have to resort to content creation nowadays including their actual job as well because i feel like to actually make it nowadays it's not just your job and that's it it's, that's not a balanced life anymore. You also have to promote yourself mm -hmm. through social media channels and find a way to really expose how good you are at your job. Because social media is now actually part of your CV. Yes. And it can really amplify your personality and how good you are and show off your skills to, to like, you know, business owners, CEOs, and whoever wants to interact with you. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I think, I think like what you're saying about, it's only the top 5% of people. I think a lot of people have social media wrong. Like a lot of people think like, Oh, like I'm like an imposter. If I get on social media and talk about this and I'm not, I don't have the authority to talk about that. The standpoint that I, I take is like, there are always going to be people above you. You're not speaking to those people. You know what I mean? You're speaking to people you're basically just saying like everyone has overcome problems in their life in the past to get to where they are now. All you have to do is talk about the problems that you've already overcome. Cause I guarantee mm. there's a bunch of people that are dealing with those exact problems right now. And you already have the solution to it. So in your content, you're basically just talking about the stuff that you've overcome and your own story. Right. And you're going to attract an audience that way. And then as you grow, you're going to solve new problems. And then you talk about the new problems. And then you just keep growing and talking about those problems. Your content is going to change as you grow, right? But in the beginning, you're just going to be talking about the problems that you've solved in your life, right? I think that's an amazing perspective to hold when you mm -hmm. like, especially once you're grow when you're growing as a content creator to be able to motivate yourself to be um, to have that intrinsic motivation to be able to you know, know that you're helping so many people out, regardless if you have like 100, 1,000 or a million followers, you're always helping someone out because you've already experienced the things that, you know, a wise man listens to someone who, uh, a wise man listens to someone else's um, mistakes rather than just, you know, exactly. their own. So. And, and think... like, like Michael Jordan had a different coach at age eight than he did at age 25, right? So... You don't need to be, you know, Michael Jordan's coach at age 25, right? You can be coaching Michael Jordan when he's eight years old. <laughs> is kind of what I'm saying, right? Like, like the person who's 18, eight years old is going to have a different coach at every stage in their life, right? Like I can't coach a guy who drives a, a Lamborghini because they just, they've done way more in their life than me. They don't have a lot to learn from me, but I can coach somebody who's just starting out. Who's maybe like 19, 20 years old and help them through my content, right? Right. And you can also maybe learn other like new things that you haven't seen or encountered yourself through other through your students. Exactly. Because they could be making mistakes that you haven't made yet. And then you'd be aware about these mistakes because they're sharing them with you and you can learn from them. And then you just have this like whole library of experience. That's not all yours, but it's still lessons that you can use because you understood them as well. Exactly. No, you said it that I think what somebody's like the best way to learn is to teach. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, that's, that's my whole thing is like, everybody has something that they've overcome problems, whatever that they could talk about in their content, grow an audience and s sell some type of product to make money. Right. And people are like this whole thing, like, oh, coaching is a, a scam or whatever. Right. I think it's well worth it to pay $500 to learn something that maybe took somebody a year to find out 
in two weeks, right? No, it's definitely Knowledge better power, than for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely better than like spending a whole year studying one course and paying what twenty k for the whole year. Exactly. <laughs> That's it. Well, bro. Like, why are we paying 25 I mean, I don't know how much the tuition fees in the, the U.S. They're probably way more as well than the U.K. But, like, you know, mm. my bachelor's degree and my master's degree haven't been, like, the best versions of education for me. They have taught me things, for sure. But, like, but I value. prefer learning from experiences. Exactly. The value, though. Like, like, you could pay somebody that's like, hey, I like what this guy has to say. He's already, like, overcome something that I want to do. His course is 700 bucks. I was going to give this guy 700 bucks and learn what he, see what he has to say, right? Even if you learn a couple things from it, it's probably worth your money. So I'm just saying like everyone probably has something that they could teach somebody to make money online. It's just, you just got to stay consistent, actually post every day, show up and bring value to an audience, right? Right. And the thing is like people who go through getting degrees, like the only reason they're getting these degrees is because they think that they've got a shot at like getting a job. Like it's, it's the done deal. You get yeah. your degree is like, that's it. I, I'm going to get a job for sure. But the thing is companies look at these and they just see the, like the reputation of your university and the ranking of your, the university. And they're like, okay, we'll give this guy a chance. But does that mean you're going to stick with that universe, that uh, company? No, not necessarily because you don't know, like the, the people who are hiring, you don't know if you're actually good at commitment or, are loyal or you're actually going to, you know, put in the best work that you can possibly do in this for this company. Cuz maybe you start off and you're like, "Oh, this seems good. It's like there's some chemistry there." But then later on you find out we're not a good fit. It's kind of like a relationship thing, but, you know, with the business. Exactly. Exactly. No, I completely this, agree, man. This is what I learned from university. It's better to have a degree because if everyone on the table has a degree and you don't have a degree, you're going to sound, or you're going to look, or you're going to, you're not going to compete with them because they're on a different level, not on intellectual. You might know more, you might have made more money, you've done all that, but they might have a conversation you can't understand it. It definitely gives you more credibility for sure. That's the only reason. Nah. Nah, man, I don't, I don't, I don't take in that vibe that that much. Like, you know, I like to come, I like to combine, you know, academia with life experiences. No, I'm not gonna say like I, I'm not gonna throw out my degrees right out the window. No, I never said. But the thing is, no, I never said throw it out. I said, thank God. Yeah. I'm not. It's a, it's a nice plus. It's nothing more than a nice plus. And that's what it is, Paco. It's a nice plus, but for the value and the money that you're paying for it. I don't think it's worth that much. It's not. You know, but like how much have we paid for education but, over the past but you have 20 to, years? You have to understand that our parents, they see because they were raised at a time where they were raised at a time where the degree was worth it. Yeah. Yeah. The valuation used to make sense. It yeah. used to make sense. Right. Before the labor market wasn't as big as it is today. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and it's all, and like you said, as like business, this labor market is pretty much business. When everyone has a degree, your degree is worthless. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, that's what people get master's degrees to th- and be unique, even though they're not that unique. <laughs> Bro, I think people are just frauds. You know, like some most of the time, I just people. Uh... People are just like frauds. That's what it, that's what it is. If everyone meet gets all a these people, degree, you know, they... everyone's pretty Bro, much in the same boat. Yeah, exactly. There's, it's like we're all the same. Like, ev- bachelor's degree used to separate you from like the the common folk, and now and then it was master's. Sorry, bachelor's. Yeah, bachelor's degree, and then it became master's degree. And now you talk to everyone's like, everyone has a master's degree. It doesn't matter what you've what you've done in life. Like everyone has a master's degree. Now you have to graduate it, college at forty five with a PhD to be able to apply for jobs. <laughs> And, and they Bro, want like 20, know, 20 years experience when you're 25. Like, it's crazy, man. But well, you can take that route. <laughs> or you can take your own personal route and fucking make it somehow. Right. Like, which make is, something that is, works for you. Which is what Connor did, man. Connor, if I may <laughs> ask about your... Uh, I, uh, I, I've seen some posts from your Instagram, and I'm actually really curious. What the... At, at first, how old are you, if you know me asking? I'm 28. 28. Nice. Just two years older than me or than us, actually. That's crazy. If you want me asking, at what age or what point in your life did you decide that you're going to 
just put your head down, save as much money as possible, drive the same car for six years, and just try to look at investing into real estate at some point in the future. Like what at what point? Because you're pretty much our age and our generation, and like um, from from the from the overwhelming number of people I've met here in Vancouver that just have this like mentality that like there's no way I'm buying a house. Just gonna try to I don't know, just try to make it, try to get a job, you know, rent for the rest of my life. So. What what is what's the experience that separated you from the rest of these people that I'm sure you said were around you as well your whole life growing up? I mean, I kind of knew like right out of high school that I had to save my money and I had to work hard. Mm -hmm. And then pretty much, yeah, right out of the gate, right out of high school, I went on that journey and then things kind of started taking off for me. I like I started making good money when I was like 20. It was like around like 50,000 when I was like 20. And what were you doing? Because I was plumbing. And then uh, because I didn't have, I was still living with my parents at that time. I didn't really have any expenses. So I was just saving all that money. And then parents moved to Arizona at 21. And then I moved in with my girlfriend's dad. And then uh, he was only charging me 600 bucks rent. So uh, income kept going up, kept saving everything. And then by 22, I was able to buy my first place doing that. And then uh, wow. I bought under my pre-approval. So I was pre-approved at 350 and I bought at 275 because I wanted to keep saving money. And I was able to buy the second property uh, turning 24. And that one was out of province. That was a $150,000 detached in Windsor, Ontario. So I didn't buy the second property here. I bought it sight unseen, literally at the complete opposite side of Canada, just because it was cheaper and the numbers made sense, right? Um, but yeah, man, I understand it's harder today. It's definitely harder today than what it was like five, six years ago, but it's still not impossible, right? People are doing it every day. It's just hard, right? It's just hard is all it is. It's really hard, right? I mean, and if so you made you it, it just six years ago, definitely it's very possible for sure. Yeah. You see it as an investing opportunity, right? More than like you actually living in the house. You see it as, okay, I'm going to buy this house, have some tenants that pay the rent and it's just passive income for myself. You can look at it either way, right? I mean, it, de it depends which way you want to look at it. You you could – investing in Vancouver right now, it's it's tough to stomach, man. Like the numbers don't make a lot of sense. Like even on, on a rental property, you're losing like 1200 bucks a month right now out of pocket, right? But you, you could – like it makes more sense to buy something to live in right now. Um, mm. like if you, in the short term, you're like, yeah, renting, I save more money renting. The problem with renting is that's not going to be the rental amount a year or two from now. So people start renting and then they get, you know, all chillax and whatever, you know, I'm getting a good deal. I would be paying this if I bought. And then three years down the road, they still haven't saved the money. Now they're, they get kicked out. Their rent goes up 20% and the, mm. the market is another 20% higher than it was three years prior. Right. So it's usually just safer to get into the market. And then you don't have to worry about somebody kicking you out every two or three years either. Right. So I, I'd say owning here is just more of like a peace of mind thing, knowing that the market isn't going to completely leave you behind. Because unfortunately, that we're going to go back to this dystopian point of view. Unfortunately, <laughs> I think at a certain point in time, people will literally be priced out of Vancouver altogether. Like you will not be able to afford to rent here. You will not be able to afford to own here. Like that's what so I think is going there? to happen. Wait, what happens in that situation though? Well, what will there? happen in that situation is people are I think are the government start... would intervene, no? No. So what I think would happen is, I shouldn't say you won't be able to afford to live here. It's just living here is going to suck because what's going to happen is you're going to have, instead of one person living in a one bedroom condo, there's going to be two people living in there splitting the rent. Right. Because that's what happens in San Francisco and New York and like uh, Tokyo and Hong Kong and all these places. Like if you go look at like one bedroom rental listings in San Fran, there's like bunk beds in the one bedrooms like you can see. in the picture, <laughs> Right. So I don't think the situation is going to get any better. You know what I mean? I just think it's just going to continually like when has it ever gotten better? It's never gotten better. It just gets worse. Right. You know about about that. My girlfriend three years ago, uh, when I got with her, she was renting a uh, a a den in Stadium Chinatown, Vancouver, and it was like six hundred bucks at the time a month. And I shit you not, was actually a closet. It was a closet. The the entire walking distance of the closet inside the closet, like the entire space you can walk on, was just enough space for a mattress. And then the shelves were where she would put her stuff. 
Um, it's very common actually to see nowadays, like in Vancouver, four or five people living in like a two bedroom apartment with like a like a side, you know, room is just like because it's so expensive. I'm actually hanging on to my lease in US, Connor, so so much. Like I got this contract three years ago for a one bedroom. Now it's like um it went up two percent a year. He can't legally increase it more than that, the landlord. I'm great I'm grateful for the contract. And I only pay like eleven hundred bucks a month. Of course, splitting wow. that everything's fifty everything's fifty wow. percent off with my girlfriend here. So it's you know nice. together. Yeah. But the thing <laughs> is if really I did deadly. I'm really, I'm really grateful. And uh, he's never gonna kick me out, he likes me a lot and stuff. But the problem is we started looking at a year ago to move out and look look at renting somewhere nicer, fancier, you know, laundry in house and everything. And the problem is, is that uh, we were looking at like sixteen, seventeen hundred. Now in New West, we're actually looking at two thousand dollars plus for any decent, you know, laundry in suite, um, dishwasher type place in New West. It's not even Vancouver. I'd be paying a hundred percent more, you know. So, and I know people that have been hanging on to their lease for like seven, eight years that live in New West and Burnaby. Like it's 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 pretty hard if you just like if you're just not looking at investing you just want to rent a decent place and live you're looking at paying like half your half your salary just to be able to afford it if you want to live by yourself um, yeah so it's crazy man yeah so i mean that that's what i mean by like eventually i think there's a point where a lot of people will just be like just capitulate just this is too much for me i'm moving to like calgary i'm moving to new brunswick i'm moving wherever else because mm. like i don't want to pay thirty one hundred dollars to rent a one bedroom right you know like, what i feel I feel like this conversation that we're having feels like we're going to lean more towards a more conservative mindset. Like, Do elaborate, mean? Paco. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, please. Carry no, because if we look at all the problems in the U.S. and in Canada and in Europe, and it's because like we have too many social programs that cost a lot of money. Yeah. And people can't afford anything anymore because all these programs are happening at one time and then you have a certain other budgets like the military and like and all this informing into one and then crazy mm. and then we can't afford that and that's a problem and then you're looking at like if people can't afford rent how are they gonna afford taxes to pay the government Parker, you're yeah. so right yeah. Like, like the government is giving us all of these social programs and then making us pay for them by by taxes. taxes. But for example, if you go to Lebanon, we don't have any social programs. We don't have any of those, but we don't have taxes as well. And yeah. the reason why Lebanese people are successful abroad is because they were taught in Lebanon when they don't have any social programs to fucking stick it out for themselves and yeah. make it happen by themselves. So yeah. fuck the social programs, man. Yeah. Remove that shit. Everyone yeah. should find their own way. No, I'll tell you why. Very simple. Because they lost. Because people that didn't have, want to have more in, when they leave, like let's say they travel abroad and they start making, yeah. they want to hold on to the, what they have because they never had it where they were originally from. Yeah. Because, like, and you're right about the social programs thing because uh, when the government just like keeps lending out a hand to the people, yeah, the people are just going to find like, depend on it they're just going to rely on like the yeah. government saving their asses that's why you have a lot of people just like living off benefits and finding sc scams and ways to mm. just survive on benefits like, instead of trying to create something for themselves and make their own income and f yeah. and actually think outside the box and create the type of passive income that for example connor is doing you know like, these ideas have to come from somewhere and if you're just like connor, not working you're connor? not going to do it at point at nineteen eighteen, he was awake. A lot of people my age are still asleep. Unfortunately, I'm mm -hmm. twenty six, and people are still asleep. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's just a lot of people think at some point. A lot of people live their life by the law of like accident, right? They think just like at <laughs> some point, for some reason, they're just gonna like get into uh, a house. Something's gonna happen, but they don't actually like live their life with the intention of I'm going to make this happen. If you want to own a house in Vancouver, you have to actively be working towards that every single day. And the problem is they're not, they're just like, Oh, the government will do this eventually and I'll get a house or whatever. Right. But you actually have to be like, all right, I'm going to work today so I can have residual income at the end of the month 
to save money than to then eventually buy a house. And if you don't have that intent of making that happen, then it won't happen. You right? need the options to align with the reality you want to live in, for sure. The one exactly. you want to pursue. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So, no, I, I agree. I mean, a lot of people blame landlords and they blame they, they blame realtors, too. Right. I get that a lot, too. And they blame like it, it realistically is the government. Right. It's realistically they've been overspending money for a long time, which has caused inflation. They have synthetically toyed around with the economy, which is exactly like I like to call it like the economy is just a guy who's overused steroids at this point. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> now now they've uh, injected so much trend and DECA into the economy that now, you know, our normal <laughs> testosterone levels will never recover. Right. And that's essentially what the government has done over the, the last economy now has erectile this function yeah well you know what the funny part is no 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 hold on hold on sharif that was spectacular bro that was a good one your shades are spectacular thank you bro they're my my what's it called my flatmates i borrowed them nice nice uh, actually, uh, Connor, one more thing about the government. I think is one thing that they did recently. Uh, I think like about a year ago, is that they uh, they I don't know if they started taxing or they stopped foreign investment in Vancouver properties. What what, what yeah, was what did. was the story behind that? Yeah, I mean their their whole thing is like they they're just trying to find another boogeyman to like blame the the government on. Like, oh yeah, it you know it wasn't us lowering interest rates to zero and printing ten trillion dollars. It was the foreign investors who weren't even buying because the country was closed for two years. That's who it was. So whenever things get out of whack, the people get really pissed off. Like obviously, like like social unrest is like really high right now. People have a lot of stuff to be pissed off about. So that was just like one thing that they were like, oh, it's not our fault. It's the foreign investors, right? Because they, mm. they did that They did that in 2016 too, where they added the tax to the foreign investors. Go look at the price of real estate since 2016. Did the tax do anything? No, right? So what's the next thing? Let's just ban them entirely. Oh, real estate's up 10% since the ban, right? So <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, it's obviously they've been found out for their bullshit, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I mean... I've I've had a few people reach out that were foreign buyers who wanted to buy here. So, I mean, it does have an effect to a certain degree, but I think they actually ran a study and it's like one less than 1% of transactions are foreign investors or something like that. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. That's way more than people say, man. Wait, yeah. so Connor, what do you think is the next excuse the government is going to use? Oh, that's a really good question. What is the next? They're going to blame they're going to blame Connor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Connor they're, Kelly, man. They're they're gonna start blaming like, I don't know. They're gonna start blaming developers for like, freaking uh, hoarding supply or something like that, right? Because developers are not gonna build because it's not mm. profitable to build right now because interest rate costs are so high and prices are down. So developers are probably just gonna sit on land. Like building permits are down like twenty percent right now or whatever. So they're going to start putting out articles that like D these greedy developers are restricting the supply and blah. It's going to be like the developer's fault now or something. That's my best guess anyways. Pretty much. Do you think, <laughs> you think it'll actually work? Like, come on. It was like they put another developer's task uh, tax mm -hmm. and it's just going to be like, you know, you're going to notice another spike in the I don't think the they prices. have any plans on actually fixing the housing problem. And, and even if they mm. did, they can't. Right. So what they do instead is they just like create a problem and then they add a tax so they can get some tax revenue from the problem. But they can't uh, actually fix the problem because it's Connor, based do you, on supply and demand. Connor, do you have a solution for this problem? All right. So what they've always done is they've always had a uh, short term solution by printing money. Mm. Every time this it always backfired. Like look at 2008. <laughs> Obama, in the Obama administration, what they do, they printed more money. And the worst thing was for them to do was to print more money. Because that's something that's not going to fix America. Yeah, that's that's them in, injecting trend into the economy, yeah. basically, right? But so, this, I, I completely agree, man. Like, um, the solution, I think... I think it's too far gone. I don't think there is a solution. I don't think there's any way for them to fix this problem at this point. 
we're I think too, it's just way too far gone. We're too used to the good times. You have to understand that this generation of people, our generation of people, is too used to good times. They don't want the good times to end. So how do we solve that, Paco? Uh, how do we, we have, make them focus on the, not the we, good times, but actually dealing with the hardships? Cut down on military expenses. Cut down on social uh, programs like, for instance, healthcare. Healthcare is a big expense that you'd be surprised is a very schooling. Like, why do we give out free, uh, <laughs> free university education? I don't think it should be free. I think it should be necessary, but it shouldn't be free. I think it should be come at a small cost. Um, I think America is much worse in military spending than Canada. To be to be fair, they, mean, they actually spend like. Ten times look, more than the second maybe, to seventh place behind them after. You have to look at it this way. Canada, England, England itself, because England is own, owns Canada. Canada, it's still owned by the Queen or the King now. Just on paper, she doesn't do anything. Rest in peace. God rest her soul. It's no, the okay. King now. It's no longer the Queen. It's the King, yeah. Okay, but uh, your land is still run by the Queen, by the King. Unfortunately, unfortunately, like... It's good for him, but it's shitty for everyone else. Yeah. Wait, is that true? Can we fact check that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, Canada, I don't. I don't think. Uh... I think it's just on paper. You do, you actually, if you do, if you get Canadian citizenship, since if you get Canadian citizenship, you actually do have to swear loyalty to the king or queen before. Yeah. Uh, but it's just like a it's like a formal thing. They don't actually do anything. Prime Minister, Senate, Parliament does so much more like of the decisions. It's just like a title thing that like oh the queen or now the king owns canada and actually the king now owns like tw over 25 percent of the world's land mass like geographically like it's oh wow but it's just like a title thing like they own like a part of islands in in, in north america they own part of africa they own but it's just like a title thing they don't actually bro, for formal formality shmore shmore who cares <laughs> who cares bro it's the king isn't doing anything for canada <laughs> like for people to actually get out of their problems <laughs> It's not, it's, they can't rely on the government doing it for them. That's and, simple. Yeah. It's like, and like, we're, we're ca we can't be relying on others to do it. Mm -hmm. I like the, what's, I really, I want to understand what do you guys think is the first step to like solving this, this issue? Dude, all they mm -hmm. can do is increase the supply by allowing more build, builds to actually happen by changing zoning, by approving more permits, whatever. But that's mm -hmm. not going to make real estate more affordable. It'll just slow the rate of which prices go up. So, yeah. and the other thing is like, developing still has to be profitable for people to develop. So even if they take all of Vancouver and go, everything is rezoned to high rises, you can build a high rise anywhere you want, right? Mm -hmm. If 50 developers go and build a high rise at the exact same time, it, all of the product isn't going to be absorbed by the market and then it will push yeah. prices down and then it won't be profitable to build and then people will stop building. So even if they go and rezone everything and let everybody build whatever they want, whenever they want, it still has to be profitable to build, which means prices will have to keep going up for that to be the case, right? So mm -hmm. I don't think there's any way to fix the problem. And then people will say stuff like, well, Let's stop immigration and that'll fix the problem. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> no. no. And unfortunately, the way CPP is set up is we need immigration so that uh, the people who are retiring now have a pension plan because they've been paying into it their entire lives. Mm. And if they are just like at suddenly, oh, we don't have enough young people to pay your pension that you've been paying into your entire life, there would be a freaking massive revolt going on, right? So they have to keep yeah, all well, people in the country to pay into CPP, right? <laughs> wow. Okay. So um, should I buy a house? Should I rent? What's the deal here? What's the best okay. thing for me to do? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. I think you should buy a house. However, when you buy the house, you should run your numbers that in the worst case scenario, you will be able to pay your mortgage. Mm -hmm. Right. And if the answer is yes, you can then buy the house. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. But so the do you thing think is, people in, in how much time do you expect to pay that mortgage off? You know, the thing is, like, you can, I can pay my mortgage probably. But like, if I buy a one bedroom apartment in Vancouver, I can probably pay my mortgage off, but like in 30 years rather than, you know, like in, in a reasonable amount of time. I think it's not just the 
if you can pay it off, it's just and how much time can you pay it off? You know, would you be able to own the house by the time you, you know, get into your 50s or 40s? I think the amount of time it takes you is a big factor as well. Well, mm-hmm. I think you should get a 30 year mortgage. And, and here's the thing, right? The reason why owning a home is so good is because wa- the wages do go up. They don't go up with inflation, but they do go up. And your mortgage payment should, aside from this one time in the last like 30 years, your mortgage payment should stay basically the same, right? So in 10 years, there's something called debt erosion, right? The reason why rich people like taking on debt is because inflation actually erodes the balance of your debt. Right. So if you take out $300,000 worth of debt at 5% inflation next year, you actually only have $285,000 worth of debt because that 300 grand is worth a lot less. Less, Right. In theory. Wow. Right. Mm -hmm. So after owning a house for 10 years, right, like my mortgage is a thousand dollars, which was like a decently big mortgage in 2017. Right. But now it looks hilarious. Right. So if you have a mortgage from like 15 years ago, like a two, a three thousand dollar mortgage 15 years from now, it's probably going to be freaking hilarious. Right. And your income is like the average income is going to be like one hundred and sixty grand or one hundred and eighty grand. Right. So that's the beauty of owning a home is that in the first five years, you may not really notice it. But after 10, 15 years, your mortgage payment should be relatively small in comparison to what a normal income is at that time. Wow. Very long term game. I see what you're saying about that. You know, yeah. I really value my my freedom, Connor. So in one sense, buying a house offers you financial freedom because you're investing in yourself. <clears throat> Another sense, you're tied to a place. You're tied to a house, an object that mm-hmm. you can't really get rid of really easily. You know, it takes a lot of time and money to buy and sell houses. Um, and I don't get to have the location freedom of being able to move. Right now, I'm month to month. Um, if something like breaks, you know, it's up to the the owners, you know, to fix it. Mm-hmm. Um, it gives me but a lot, of, lot more leeway. Keep mm-hmm. this in mind. Freedom is options, right? So mm-hmm. in the first five years, you don't have a lot of options with that home. So mm-hmm. for example, when I first bought my condo, it rented for a thousand fifty. Now it rents for twenty one hundred. So wow, seven years down the road. You could move and just rent out your condo because it'll probably be cash flow positive at that point because your mortgage is roughly the same, but rent has gone up like 50%. So your condo will probably be cash flow positive at that time. So you could probably just rent out your condo and then go travel or do whatever you want to do, but at least you have it and now it's actually making you money, right? That makes total sense. All right, I'm sold. So so Connor, uh, quick quick, quick question. It's, It's common knowledge that in Vancouver specifically, the housing market is a lot more prohibitive expensive than I mean other uh, parts of Canada why is that it's just supply and demand right I'm pretty sure if Vancouver was the same price as Winnipeg every single person in Winnipeg would move to Vancouver and that would (laughs) Vancouver instantaneously right so it's just the way it has to be right as I was saying is like Vancouver it always has to be slightly out of reach for the average person otherwise there would just be too many people living here it just wouldn't make sense we don't have enough homes there to house the amount of people that want to live here. So it always has to be just out of reach. That makes sense. Yeah, Vancouver is m- much more beautiful than every, any other part of Canada, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so that brings up like the basic like foundations of economics, which I, I learned in my, one of my classes in economics. Demand and supply. There's a high demand in Vancouver. It's, and, that's what, and there's low supply. So that's why prices are so high. Exactly. And like, I think about it, like in my basic mind, in my simple mind about of economics, it, how do we decrease demand so that prices go down? You can't, well, yeah, you, you, you can play with demand, but demand is, you're basically just trying to shove a balloon underwater with demand. Mm. Like you can only yeah. subside demand for so long before people need to move. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like people mm-hmm. have kids, people get married, people need more space, people have to move, right? So it's like tra- transactions are going to happen. People who are retiring in Calgary are probably sick of winter eight months a year, and they've probably dreamed of living on the West Coast. <laughs> so they want to retire here, right? Because yeah. in Canada, if you want decently mild weather, there is one place in all of Canada <laughs> that has, that is it, right? That's Vancouver, all we have. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. 
Just, so and even here, they call it rain Vancouver for a reason, guys. Like, it's just raining so much. <laughs> like, But, yeah. like, the summers here are really nice, though. Where do you live, Connor? I live in Abbotsford, uh, originally from Surrey. Oh, wow. Yeah. Dude, yeah. those are two of the cheapest places to rent or buy in all of BC. That's crazy. That makes a lot exactly. of sense. Exactly. Yeah, so I just wanted to get in the market, right? Like, I grew up in Surrey. Everybody I knew is from Surrey, but I just wanted to get in. You know what I mean? And then I actually ended up liking Abbotsford, so now I'm just chilling here. It's a smaller community. It's pretty nice, I guess. Uh, but uh, even there, I, I know that uh, I recently heard there was, like, the there was a house sold there for, like, a million dollars. Like, even the Abbotsford market's going up in terms of housing prices. Yeah, like, a decent house is, like, one one now. Probably. And Abbotsford, guys, is like is like an hour maybe away from where we are by car, so it's kind of like far from the city. I live in the US; yeah. it's like twenty minute drive from Vancouver, but like Abbotsford is a decent bit far. Do you so and and and, and do you do you have a commute or do you work from home? I guess with your platform. I actually drive a Dodge Ram. It's a freaking gas guzzler. Um, <laughs> oh, I'd of like course. To get a Tesla, but my <laughs> gas bill is like freaking eleven hundred bucks a month right now. It's crazy. I can Yikes. imagine, man. This year, guys, we saw like crazy, crazy Vancouver gas what? prices. It was yeah. like it was like two, two liters, it was like two 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 dollars a, a liter or something. At some point, it was something crazy. Yeah, it's 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 Recently. nuts, man. No, I, I need to get a Tesla for sure, for sure. <laughs> yeah, a actually, uh, six months That's ago, I saw payment. a lot. Of, I hey, saw a lot of you... Rams just parked. Like fifty. That's what you need to get, or a Chevy. Don't get a Dodge. Chevy. Yeah, Dude, okay. honestly, I don't even like the Dodge, man. <laughs> I don't like the Dodge at all. I like the Ford better. I actually, I actually do like the Ford better. You know why I bought the Ram? I'll tell you why I bought the Ram. Because I had a Lincoln before, and the engine ex- like literally like freaking exploded. Like it, it was done. Like one of the <laughs> one of the cylinders blew. So I poured this liquid in the engine. Hopefully Ford isn't listening to this. I poured this liquid in the engine that <laughs> plugs the hole. And it plugs it for like a couple days, right? And I was like, they wouldn't give me the warranty on the Lincoln. It was five years, wow. 400,000 kilometers. And mine was like five years and two months old. So I was like, you know what? Oh, Fuck wow. you guys. You guys are going to warranty this whether you like it or not. And I put that <laughs> liquid in the engine and I drove to the dealership. And the only thing they had on the lot that I wanted was that ramp. So I was like, I'm just going to, I couldn't drive it around because if the check engine came on, it was done. It was like a $5,000 car, right? Wow. So I just... They, they take the thing for a test drive. I'm like sweating bullets in the sales center. The check engine light never came on. I'm like, yeah, I want that Ram. Took it, signed the paperwork right there, got out of there. They gave me like 20 grand for it. Dude, I, I, hope, I hope no car insurance provider sees this video, man. Yeah, yeah. But that's, that's oh why God. I have the Dodge Ram. Otherwise, I would have got like a Ford or something else. It's a badass car, though, honestly. It's a monster on the road, man. What's your... Hey? Um... Which Connor. year, uh, the Dodge? A way it's, year. A, it's a 2017. All right, but yeah, yeah, um, it's not, Con- yeah. <laughs> have you thought about the the homeless issue? Um, the houseless people just everywhere. What's the solution? I don't know if you here in LA, it's a lot. I can't yeah. imagine. In, uh, we have Vancouver. a huge homeless issue in Vancouver, mm-hmm. specifically Vancouver. Not in other cities. I mean, US is pretty <laughs> good. Uh, there is a bit of homelessness, but Vancouver has a street that looks like downtown uh, Philadelphia, like zombies. It's called Hastings. Everyone knows it. I knew it after two yeah. months here, even before interacting with anybody. Just everyone knows what Hastings Street is. It's a street of just zombies, tents, people tro- like with like uh, carts from like the supermarket just full of like random garbage. It's, it's horrible. Actually, uh, this summer, it was affecting tourism a lot. A lot of businesses on Hastings were actually complaining that People coming from abroad to visit Vancouver are actually uh, repulsed and disgusted by the state of the city. Chinatown is a beautiful historical part of Vancouver, but it's just littered everywhere, everywhere. Just homeless, drug addicts, fentanyl addicts, people doing meth on the street. It just looks horrible. And um, and the thing is, the, the government resigned themselves to doing safe injection sites to stop people from overdosing and killing themselves. Safe injection sites are actually encouraging a lot of people to just sit and do drugs all day next to the, on the street. So it's like, I don't know if they're doing what they can to fix it. Um, what's your perspective, Connor? I don't know, man. I, I, I don't know how you'd fix that problem. I, re- I really don't. Like, it would require a lot of funding, 
which would mean they would have to cut spending somewhere else. But even if they had the funding, where are you going to put them? Like we, we don't even have land to like sell to people who actually want to buy it. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I, I just, I don't know where, I don't know where they would go. Right. I don't know how to fix that problem. I think, I think what they're doing right now is, is, is the best solution. Send some cops there once a week, spend a million dollars a month, just kind of policing the area. And then that's it. Like, I, I don't know what else you could do with that situation. Short, move, move short, to completely, completely inhumane. Right. Yeah. It's pretty much killing everybody. Yeah. So you can't do that. No. <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of people here who believe in like you should just exterminate them just like no <laughs> like, i mean they're, they're human beings but the thing is man like I, i've actually been there so many times i once saw a poor a poor old chinese lady just walking down the street on the sidewalk minding her own business with her purse just like walking so slowly i see two guys just like in hoods face all scarred obviously addicted to some horrible synthetic drugs and they start like harassing her, like doing dog noises around mm. her, it's like running around her and just like trying to grab her purse. Not even to, they don't want to rob her or anything. They just want to harass her. There's obviously on something. And it's like, that, that, that's the point where I was like, dude, people can't even safely go in the city anymore. Like they can't even live their lives, just do nothing. Just sit around. You can't even sit around on Hastings anymore without expecting to be, you know, attacked or harassed by some crazy guy who might just inject you with a needle or something. Jetties, I do have a question. So what is your gun policy in Canada? Is it like... It's very strict. It's, Vancouver, Vancouver, I think, is very strict. BC is strict on guns. Yeah. You should guys go to Missouri. <laughs> Missouri, <laughs> yeah. That's the solution. <laughs> <laughs> send, send, them all to, send them all to Missouri. <laughs> they'll, they'll have to defend themselves there. They can uh, see how, the, how to deal with Connor, life you know, over there. Connor, our no. friend Paco here was uh, running a grocery store in Missouri, St. Louis, and he used to get they used to have bulletproof windows because they used to get shot at by people like drive-bys going past the That's fucking crazy. grocery store. So That's in Missouri, crazy. yeah. <laughs> you know, I hear Surrey has a lot of crime. I've heard that always since I've been here, like especially Newton and Wally. Have you ever experienced anything in that part they of Surrey? I have. I mm. have, yeah. But I was also a pretty stupid kid growing up. I mean, for the most part, like Surrey, it leaves you alone if you leave it alone. You know what I mean? Like, there's no real, like, if you're a normal guy walking down the street, nobody's going to rob you. But if you are blatantly looking for trouble, that's other people who are looking for trouble are probably going to try and rob you, right? What do you do? Well, what happened when you were a kid? I just hang out with the wrong people. That kind of story, mm. right? I mean, that's when you're a teenager, that's it's cool to, like, be stupid, right? Pretty much. Yeah. So, I mean, Surrey's so not bad, though. <laughs> Connor, no, yeah, I, yeah, sure. I have a question for you. So we here, well, I'd say all well, most of us are, we're pretty much nerds, you know. So I wanted to ask, are you a nerd yourself? I was a nerd. Yeah, actually, get ready for this. So in two thousand nine, I was debatably the best mage in the world in World of Warcraft. Wow! <laughs> Did not see yeah. this coming. Yeah. Whoa! Where'd that yeah. come from, man? <laughs> I played WoW yeah. every day for like ten years, probably. Dude, that's crazy, uh, dude. WoW, being a mage in WoW was hard, man. You have a really important role in like the raids and and like dungeons and stuff. Like, oh, I loved it, man. I w I wish I wish I could go back to that feeling. It's never the same, though. Never the same. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I tried playing WoW a few times. Uh, I'm playing it now, actually. I'm getting into it. Like, I've only been playing it for like a year. Uh, they make you, they force you to start on Battle of Azeroth. You still play it? No, not anymore. It, it'll never, it'll never be like it was back from like two thousand. Definitely, yeah, I hear that a lot from people. It was Wrath of the Lich King, was, yeah. Bro, it was life for a long time. It was life for <laughs> man, for millions of people. It was life, and I also played CS:GO and RuneScape and all those games too, Diablo wow. two and all that stuff. Yeah. Ah. No, I get you, man. I get you because like when I was when I was young, I used to I grew up on like the Ratchet and Clank franchise on the PlayStation. Yeah, and now. Sometimes they release them like for free on, uh, on the PS Plus. So I and I so mm -hmm. I just you know, I play them a bit just to see like you know have some reconcile on like old memories and stuff. Some but whenever nostalgia. I played, yeah, just some nostalgia. Exactly, that's the word I was looking for. And when I'm playing them, I'm just after like maybe ten minutes of gameplay, I'm just like I can't go on, man. 
Like the graphics no. are shit. It's not the same, you know. Like at the it's time the when same. I was playing it, yeah, it was just it was the best thing I've ever seen in my life. But now, at the time, it's, yeah, it's crazy. It doesn't do it, man. Yeah, it's, like the game is still fun, but it's still not the same. It's just not so, the same. Uh, Definitely. <laughs> what's driving you forward, Connor? So right now you're hustling. You got the real estate going. You got the girlfriend going. You got your life going in Canada. You've off the video games. Okay. So what's the plan? You're gonna work, work, work. Um, do you still game in general? If you don't mind me asking, sorry to interrupt. Do you game no. in general? Do you have time for it? Okay. I don't game anymore. I don't have any vices. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't do anything. I pretty much just focus a hundred percent on my mission right now, which is basically I want to create the best version of myself that I possibly can, and then give that back to the world and just help as many people as I possibly can and get rich as fuck in the making while doing it. Um, Hell yeah, that's bro. That's basically my life mission right now. It's just, I'm completely 100% focused on creating the best possible version of me that I can. Um, you know, I I wish that I had somebody like me in my life when I was 20 years old to kind of show me the way. And I'm proud of that, that I, I would literally be my own role model when I was 20 years old. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. That's that's <laughs> kind of what I want to keep doing, you know. That's the best thing, that's man. What, like, even if you don't have a mentor, yeah, even if you don't have yeah. a mentor, like back when you were younger, you can become your mentor because you just look at what you wanted to, what did what you wanted to see in someone to inspire you, and then you become that inspiration for yourself. Epic. <laughs> All right, Connor. Oh, where can people guys? find you? I agree. Oh. Mhm. Mm Sounds good to me. Mhm. Mm oh. Well, this has been another episode of Way to the Show. It's Sorry, okay, I'm back. Internet connection got choppy there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Connor. Well, bro, I don't know if I was lagging or Connor was lagging. It was like cuz I've been, yeah. my internet has been terrible for like for a yeah. while now. <laughs> if you come to Lebanon, yeah, you would know. Every every guy knows here except for Connor. The internet <laughs> is a uh, A-OK. -okay. <laughs> um Connor, what advice would you give yourself to your younger self at 20 years old and then where can people find you? Um, yeah, I would say it. number one piece of advice, drop the vices, man. Like that is, I, I cannot say enough how much that changed my, that one thing will improve your life tenfold, almost instantaneously. Drop the vices and also stop being so short-sighted. When you're like 20, 20, 21 years old, whatever, um, a year feels like a really long time. Two years feels like a really long time. And three years is so far away, you can't even envision it. But then once you get over 25, time starts going by like way faster, right? So fast. And yes. So why why is that? I don't really know, to be honest with you. But all I know is if I could go back, you know, like I was so short-sighted, like, oh, I need to do this in three months, or I need to do this in six months. And whereas if I just took the mindset of like, I'm going to start a YouTube channel and then like maybe in five years, it'll, it'll be something if I'm consistent. I would be a lot further ahead than where I'm at right now. Wow. That's probably what I'd say. Um, you could follow me at that agent Kelly. I recently, uh, uh, I'm going to sales pitch on here. I recently started a coaching program, two ninety nine a month, seven fifty for three, twelve ninety nine for six, nineteen ninety nine for a year. If you want to hop on the team, hop on the program. More than happy to help. Everything that I'm teaching took me five six years to learn. I'm giving it to you guys for two hundred fifty bucks a month. So that's my mo. Let's do it. All right, sign it out. Sign us out. Come on, side. Skill D, right, skill dumb, bro. You guys heard it from the from the main agent, the main guy, Connor Kelly. He used to be the first, the number one major in World of Warcraft, but now he's the number one <laughs> agent, real estate agent in the whole Canada, man. Like that's that's what I'm sticking with all of Canada. Yeah, yeah. you got it. This is how we yeah, end the, the podcast. Boys, <laughs> we appreciate you, man. Thank you for coming on the show, on, and we salute to the camera to end it. <laughs>